Kia ora koutou, Korich and Bulma Takawangwa. So today, Conrad and I are going to summarise the cumulative effects synthesis project and associated guidelines, which were written up by Georgina, Conrad and myself, with input from the science leadership team and the communications team. Uh, these guidelines were generated based on challenge research, as well as input from central and regional government. As a key driver of marine e ecological decline, cumulative effects has been a focal area of challenge research. We urgently need ways to improve the management of cumulative effects in Aotearoa. As part of this project, we've synthesized some of the relevant research on cumulative effects and provide a four point action plan that can be used to improve cumulative effects management, which we'll cover today. The guidelines and summary discussed today can be found on the Sustainable Seas Tohoro website, along with the underpinning research. The Tohoro website interface is AI driven and directs you to research streams of interest, including the guidelines, roadmaps, papers, et cetera. Refined, and it's refined based on your needs, so we, can, we encourage you to take a look. The project is closely linked to the Risk and Uncertainty Project, which Joe and Alice will be covering next, as well as many of the other synthesis projects, including restorative marine economies. Conrad will now cover some of the key sustainable seas research underpinning the cumulative effects project. And then I'll cover a four point action plan that we have developed based on this research to improve the management of cumulative effects in Aotearoa. Over to you, Conrad. Kia ora everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, Conrad here. Um, I guess um, one of the first things we need to think about with cumulative effects is if we're gonna do ecosystem-based management, which is really the, the focus of, of the challenge, then we're gonna to need to better manage for cumulative effects. Um, with some neat work that was done by uh, another project within the challenge led by Liz McPherson and Eric Jorgensen, um, there is actually a lot of requirements by law to manage for cumulative effects and the coastal plans, coastal policy statements within the RMA and within the Fisheries Act as well, all call for assessments of cumulative effects. We've been doing a particularly poor job of managing for cumulative effects um, so far as is documented in multiple state of the environment reports that have documented the decline of the coastal uh, marine coastal ecosystems. So one of the questions that we faced within the challenge is, is why is it so hard to manage for cumulative effects and what can we do to aid cumulative effects management from a, a biophysical component? Um, next slide please Richard. So part of the reason uh, cumulative effects are so difficult to manage is that the uh, that the uh, we have multiple stresses occurring within our marine coastal ecosystems, within marine ecosystems in general. The challenge is a lot of these stresses, um, we've got an example of one here, agriculture and fishing, have many direct effects and also have many indirect effects upon the ecosystem as well. And it's these indirect effects and these direct effects that generate feedback loops that then cause ecosystems to collapse as they accumulate through space and time. So often our approach to managing for cumulative effects and our approach generally for managing stresses in marine ecosystems tends to be a sector by sector approach. So we might manage fishing activity, for example, and the direct effects of fishing on the stock biomass, but don't consider the indirect effects such as habitat alteration and the resuspension of sediments. And so we need better frameworks and better tools um, for managing um, cumulative effects. Um, next slide, please, Richard. So when we started this piece of work within the challenge, um, we began by uh, looking at how other uh, jurisdictions and other nations went about cumulative effects assessments. And generally they fell into a lot of similar categories. And those categories were generally focused on identifying stressor footprints. So this is the uh, effect or the aerial extent of a particular stressor. So for example, we might be dredging in a harbour and generating a tepidity plume and mapping out what that tepidity plume might look like. We might consider then a vulnerability score for the habitats that are being affected by that particular stressor and come up with an impact score. Impact score. Then we'll repeat that exercise for, for different stresses that may be occurring in the ecosystem. And our cumulative effects assessment would be just an addition of those stresses at that particular place and that particular time and how the environment might respond. Now, one of the really uh, important things about cumulative effects is that these stresses aren't operating in isolation. Often 
they're interacting. And what that means is the effect of the two stresses operating together is often much, much larger than each of the stresses in isolation. So that makes it particularly challenging. So these kinds of cumulative effects assessments don't recognize the ecosystems as a network of responding and interacting components. And what they tend to do very, very poorly is account for the hyperconnectivity of our marine ecosystems. So activities and stresses generate impacts at one place, but through connectivity, ecological connectivity may be generating impacts in many at, at very far field distant effects, which is particularly challenging. So one of the things that a piece of work that was done within the challenge was thinking about how we can reframe these cumulative effects assessments rather than a stressor accounting exercise is begin to shift the focus into how the ecosystem might respond. Uh, next slide, please, Richard. So this piece of work, which was led by our Jasmine Lowe, PhD student at the University of Auckland, and um, looked at reframing these ecological assessments by considering the ecosystem response footprint. And this subtle shift in switching the think thinking from where the stresses are occurring and accumulating to thinking about how the ecosystems are responding to those stresses makes a fundamental shift in what we're looking for in cumulative effects assessments. So if we consider what an ecosystem footprint is, I'll just run through this, this very simple example on the right on the right hand side here on this slide. It will give you a sense for where we're coming from with this concept. So if we have a look at this uh, excellent drawing of a, of a coastal embayment, the, the blue blob that you may see there would be the activity footprint. So if we think about an activity that may be like, for example, putting in a new marina at a particular location, there'll be some dredging and deepening of the channels to accommodate the people getting their boats into that space. That may represent your activity footprint. The stressor from that activity footprint, apart from the impact on the sea floor where you're doing the dredging, is represented by the turbidity plume that's generated by that, and that's represented by that yellow footprint, much larger than the activity footprint, and the dispersal of that, of course, would be dependent on the local tides and the currents. Now, the response footprint, the ecological response footprint to that stressor footprint may look different again, and that's what's represented in those green blobs. So those green blobs represent highly sensitive habitat to that turbidity plume. So that may include species like the horse mussels, a trina, for example, that don't do well under even moderate levels of turbidity. So those habitats will be sensitive and impacted by that turbidity stress. So that gives a very patchy response in that, uh, to that stressor footprint. Then, of course, we've got to think in a connected environment and that those sensitive atrina habitats may be generating new recruits for other habitats or for sink populations, either up or down the coast, depending on the movement of the currents. So then the, um, the, the response footprint and ecological response footprint in green may be disconnected by the, from the activity footprint and the stressor footprint. So then we need, by shifting our thinking to think about how the ecosystem responds to these stresses, then we're in a much better place to account for cumulative effects. Now, this is a, a relatively simple example, um, just looking at one particular activity, but it can be adapted to thinking about multiple stresses that overlap in, in time and space. So then the question goes, how do we shift from this conceptual thinking into frameworks that may, may allow us to account for cumulative effects? Um, next slide, please, Richard. So what we uh, then evolved our thinking in is to thinking about a set of principles that will allow us to think about the ecological status of a particular place and also the stressor regime to think about the depth of the response footprint and the likelihood to generate uh, rates of degradation, but also the recovery of these ecosystems. So one of the things that these principles allow us to do is it allows us to work on knowledge that we already have and incorporate um, multiple different forms of knowledge. So in assessing these states, we can gather the monitoring data we may have for a place. We can involve hapu and iwi in terms of how things have changed in a particular place to allow us to come up with an assessment of the ecosystem its health and its resilience and its capacity to absorb further stress or further, further activities, and also what's currently going on within the ecosystem. So these ecological principles, which determine the ecological state and the health of that state, are dependent on well-grounded principles that challenge research has supported, but also many, many decades of research have supported. And they're not particularly 
uh, difficult concepts to grasp. So they include things like, are the slow structural components within ecosystem or habitat still present? In marine ecosystems, this may be the kelp forest, that may be the uh, filter feeding um, bivalve beds. These are the, the habitats or the slow structural components that if they are lost, then there's a lot of biodiversity associated with them, a lot of ecosystem functions and processes. And they're also ones that are very, very difficult to regain um, if they are lost from the ecosystem. So if they're present and in, in healthy states, then the ecological status would be, would be high. The ecological network structure is an assessment of how well these different components are interacting. We've got other measures of ecological connectivity, the diversity of habitats. So these combinations of attributes give you an idea of how healthy that state is. Notice there's no numbers on this, it's just low or high, and it's just a relative measure of state. There's a similar number of pr principles associated with the stressor regimes. Obviously, the number of stressors, importantly, the levels of chronic and accumulating stresses are also important. Not understanding whether those stresses generate unimodal or nonlinear responses is also really important because those responses are the ones that generate these threshold responses. And the number of points of impact within the system are also really important as well. So you can have a stressor like turbidity, for example, that will impact multiple points within an ecological interaction network. It will reduce the light availability affecting primary producers. It will clog the gills of suspension feeding bivalves. It will settle to the sea floor and alter the sediment biogeochemistry and nutrient processing within those systems. So again, multiple knowledge systems can contribute to understanding um, these different ecological states. And if we know something about that, we know something about the capacity of the system to absorb um, further effects. Um, next slide, Richard. I don't know if I'm back to you again. Yeah, so the last thing I, I just want to hit on here before we, I hand back to Richard is this stuff sounds fairly conceptual, and it is, but um, we've generated as part of the challenge a number of roadmaps of how do I assess the ecological status of a place using these principles. There's also a, another uh, roadmap for assessing the stress, stressor status of a place. And these roadmaps are meant to act as a how-to guide to apply these principles um, for, for your place and your situation. And in particular with the stressor status is also associated with that as a spreadsheet which provides a matrix of typical activities in close coastal environments, the stresses that they generate, and a checklist against whether they are likely to be chronic and accumulating or um, impact multiple points in the interaction network. Um, so I think I'll, I'll finish up there, Richard, and, and hand back to you at this stage. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, that was a really good summary of sort of the underpinning research that goes into this four-step action plan that I'll cover today. Um, and the idea is to provide guidance on how cumulative effects could be better assessed and managed when making consenting decisions, developing targets or limits, or for informing strategic planning. So there's four key steps, and we're going to anchor these in a case study example in the next slides. But at a high level, the steps are we want to identify where we want to be. So, for example, what ecological state do we want for the area and how might this affect the proposal? Some considerations might include um, how does this sit within the context of a strategic plan or an iwi management plan? Noting that this is typically wider than an ecological outcome and considers other factors such as social, cultural and economic objectives. In other sustainable seas, uh, guidance can can provide um, some guidance on these factors, but for this project, we're focusing on the ecological. Uh, step two is identifying what's affecting the place. So we provide guidance on how you would assess the existing stresses as well as the new or proposed activity stresses based on stressor principles that Conrad covered. Um, step three is identifying the state of the current ecosystem within the area of concern and over the wider relevant spatial scale and how it's responding to stresses. So here we provide guidance on how to assess the ecosystem response footprint relative to the ecological principles. And we also provide some guidance on assessing the risks and uncertainties in the assessment, which Joe Alice will cover in further detail in the next talk. Step four is identifying the best management approach to achieve the outcomes of step one. And the possible approaches de depend on the result of the assessment, and this could be to accept, modify, or decline an activity or an action. It may be to consult expert advice and refine the assessment. 
to monitor or develop mitigation measures to reduce stresses and let the environment or place recover, or perhaps the need to go further and also establish restorative actions, maybe to develop mitigation um, actions, to change the location for the activity, and it may include adaptive management requirements in the consent conditions, for instance. So within the guidelines, we applied the section plan to three hypothetical decision-making scenarios to show its usefulness. And for each example, there's a corresponding figure showing the proposed activity footprints, the associated activity stressor footprints, the ecological response footprints, and all of which occupy different spatial extents. There's also the bar chart that Conrad covered, um, showing the associated stressor and ecological principles in a corresponding level. So the three examples that we included was a large scale aquaculture consent, a small scale seawall consent and a management plan for a barren recovery. And I'll cover the um, aquaculture example in a little bit more detail here. So taking this aquaculture example, the first step is to work out where we want to be. So it's determining the aims, aims and objectives. So in this hypothetical example, it's determined if an aquaculture development could be accommodated within a coastal bay by assessing its cumulative impact. And as part of this, we'd also consider what the short and longer term goal is for the area. So for example, by looking at outcome statements about the bay and surrounding area and its existing values or restoration goals, either already written or being consulted on. Step two is identifying what's affecting the place. So we'd assess the stresses associated with the activity or management action of interest. And present, present stresses might include things like sedimentation, nutrients, uh, low nutrient processing capacity, hypoxia, and other fishing impacts. And we would define these as moderate to high stressor status as assessed using these stressor state principles. Then we think about the new or proposed activity stresses, and these might include things like um, organic matter deposition to the seafloor, microplastics, barriers to migratory species, genetic changes to wild species, pesticides, drugs, excretion, noise, structures, shading, biosecurity, the list goes on, but um, we would consider co we would correspond this to a high stress stressor status as assessed using stressor state principles. Step three is to uh, determine what the state of the current ecosystem is and how it is responding to stresses. So um, we'd think about this in the context of the ecological communities within the activity footprint. In this, in this example, within the activity footprint, uh, there might be moderate biodiversity with few slow, slow growing um, species. There might also be historic evidence of shellfish beds, but these are no longer present. So we might classify this as having moderate ecological status as assessed using ecosystem state principles. We then think about the status of the ecological communities within the ecological response footprint. And uh, like Conrad said, remembering that the ecological response footprint can be wider or spatially disconnected from the activity response footprint. Um, and that's illustrated in this figure as well. So you might have a trina beds, so horse muscle beds or scallop beds or subtotal seagrass adjacent to the proposed development. These might already be under relatively high stress and therefore have low resilience to further stress. And this might be due to sedimentation effects, for instance. So this would have high ecological status um, as assessed using ec ecosystem state principles. We then, then think about the direct effect of the activity. So for example, a key impact of an aquaculture development may be um, the deposition of organic matter to the seafloor. And this might result in the loss of habitat diversity within the footprint. And therefore we would characterize this as having high stress, stress status. And then we'd think about the cumulative effects of the activity. So here we'd consider factors such as the impacts on ecological connectivity within and outside the footprint, how resilient or vulnerable these communities currently are, the historic potential for recovery. For instance, um, in this example, there's historic signs of shellfish in the area. And on balance, we might assess this as having high ecological status and high stressor status. We'd also think about the risks and uncertainties associated with our assessment. 
So we might have uncertainties in regards to the larval connectivity between the activity footprint and the wider ecosystem footprint, or we might have uncertainty in regards to how future stresses such as sea level rise or um, ongoing sedimentation might interact with the activity stresses. And finally, then we'd use this um, information to determine what our management approach is for this place. So for this example, we've determined that the proposed activity has a high ecological status and a high stressor status. And there's uncertainty in regards to the impacts of the activity on ecological connectivity. So these risks would then justify further in-depth assessment of cumulative effects from the activity before a decision to proceed with the application. And that may be to bring in additional experts to conduct additional monitoring, for instance, or provide additional expert advice. So that was a brief summary of our four point action plan and how it might apply to an aquaculture consent. Remembering that we also provide a similar example for a small scale seawall consent and a kinabarren restoration. For all these examples, the cumulative effects of the activities and the associated management recommendations was dependent on the ecological and stressor status not only with the, within the activity footprint, but also the ecosystem response footprint. And this emphasizes the necessity of focusing on ecosystem responses rather than solely stress and management and management decision-making. So thanks for listening to the cumulative effects summary and we'll hand it over for questions now. Kia ora Conrad and Rich, thank you for that. Uh, we've got one question that's come through, so I'll just read that one out. Uh, in your example of fin fish aquaculture, how do you account for increasing marine heat waves, ocean acidification, deoxygenation, the first of which has already had devastating effects on finfish aquaculture in Aotearoa? Where does the precautionary principle fit into your protocol? Do you want me to have a crack at that, Richard? You're welcome to. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a great question, thank you. And I guess you... Um, that has to come into your thinking and part of that will be picked up in the risk and uncertainty because what the future holds for where you put things so that has to be part of your planning process is thinking about what the the future is going to be looking like for a particular place um, and that will be you know uh, a, a really critical part of it the direct effects of the activity we can assess with this framework but then the uncertainty of course is what the future environmental conditions would look like and certainly under an ecosystem-based management approach which is the framework in which we've developed these tools those considerations would have to come into that decision making I think. Great thanks Conrad. Uh, I think we might move on now to the next section, but if you do have any more questions, you can pop them into the Q&A and we'll, uh, we'll get to them right at the end. Uh, so now I'm going to hand over to Joanne Ellis, who's going to talk to us about addressing risk and uncertainty in marine management decisions. Okay, kia ora everybody. Um, I'm going to present today on risk and uncertainty, the risk and uncertainty project. Um, my name is Joanne Ellis and Judy Hewitt will also be um, answering questions and answers in this session. So in terms of the challenge, um, we've just heard from the Cumulative Effects Programme that today's management reality is one of thinking about cumulative effects we have not only land-based impacts such as sediments and nutrients and pollutants that impact our marine and coastal environments, we also have marine-based activities such as fishing, dredging and aquaculture, and superimposed on this we, we also have climate change um, and the very important question that's just been asked around managing for things such as acidification and heat waves and obviously increasing marine sedimentation. So from an EBM or e ecosystem-based management perspective, what that means is that we're actually managing for these multiple activities and uses, but we're also uh, managing to preserve varying values and uses that people have for our marine environments. And this uh, impacts not only risk, but also our perceptions of risk to what values. So in terms of thinking about risk assessment methods, in the past we've tended to um, be looking at what we would call a class one risk assessment, 
we, we may be looking at the risk of a particular activity, in this case, an oil and gas platform, on one single receiving subject, uh, say a seal population. And these types of assessments um, are, are really only dealing with a direct interactions. So they're much more simple to deal with from a risk perspective. But by the time we're in a cumulative effects world, we have multiple activities. We might have oil and gas impacts. We may have uh, fishing, new emerging sectors such as offshore wind, and superimposed on this, we have climate change. Um, but obviously, we've also got the status of the ecological uh, complexity and those interactions, those direct and indirect interactions between the state of the ecosystem and the stresses, and that's been nicely outlined by the previous presentation on cumulative effects. So if we're going to be working uh, in an ecosystem-based management world, we're, we're over on this right-hand side of the, of the graph here, where we're going to need some risk assessment tools and frameworks that can enable us to consider ecological complexity, to be working with cumulative effects, and also be able to consider multiple knowledge types. So within the risk and uncertainty project, when we first started, we looked at reviews of what currently used risk assessment methods are in use in Aotearoa New Zealand and how fit for purpose they are in an EBM or a cumulative effects world. We identified 12 criteria that we believe are particularly important uh, for the risk assessment approach and for EBM. This includes whether or not the risk assessment approach can include uh, multiple values, ecosystem components, and knowledge types, whether or not the risk assessment framework can consider complexity, such as those indirect effects and feedbacks, as well as interactions. We know often from the previous presentation that when we get more than one stressor coming together, the nature of those stresses can be synergistic and have a much a greater impact on the ecosystem than we would predict if we're just assessing one stressor individually. We also identified um, that the risk assessment approach to be useful in an EBM context uh, in some cases should be able to produce spatial, temporal or locational specific outputs. And then importantly, whether or not the risk assessment consider recovery uh, temp threshold values and importantly estimates of uncertainty. So within, within the challenge um, we've been working on producing some guidance documents in terms of synthesizing the challenge research and information and what we've uh, identified is a four-step process in terms of thinking about risk. So we know that risk assessment involves the concept that risk is comprised of the likelihood of an event occurring and then the consequence of the event on something of importance. And this frames the starting point for thinking about risk assessment as risk to what values and risk from what stresses. So these two simple questions still underpin risk assessment, but what we suggest is that rather than start with the risk assessment method itself, that a four-step process is required. And the first step is thinking about risk to what values. So this is step one, identify perceptions of risk. And I'm going to run through each of these steps in turn. Step two, identify then the best risk assessment method to support that particular decision-making process. Step three, explicitly consider uncertainty. The greater the uncertainty, the more likely you will need participatory processes, etc. And step four, link the risk and uncertainty information with management decisions. And this has also been covered in the cumulative effects uh, presentation as well. So let's start with step one, identify perceptions of risk. Um, we've developed a series of, of quick guides that um, guide you through a series of questions in order to consider how people perceive risk. So we know that people perceive risk and uncertainty in diverse ways and that people value different things for our moana, and this can generate conflict over desired outcomes. 
So we need to be able to understand and navigate um, difference in order to enact more holistic approaches to managing marine spaces, uh, including EBM uh, approaches. So this includes um, that people have, underpinning these differences in terms of perceptions of risk, is that people have different disciplinary training, differing worldviews, and differing positionality. And all of these factors will influence how a particular activity is perceived and what it, that activity will impact in terms of values for that marine environment. So these, this um, first four quick guides assist with stepping through this important question of the perceptions of risk. It helps with thinking about what is considered evidence uh, what process um, you adopt, because the process can constrain the type of outcomes or results, and what balance of rights are supported. So reframing knowledge. The second step is around identifying the best risk assessment method. So it's important to not let the risk assessment method that is selected constrain the process. Um, for example, if you use a method that can only use um, quantitative information, you may be constraining the process. Uh, if you, It's important to be including local knowledge, mataranga ma Māori knowledge, and so on. So we've developed a decision tree to help choose a risk assessment method that may be fit for purpose in a particular um, process. You can see here that it, they range in complexity from medium to uh, very high, or you can have obviously low complexity. So complexity is the system complexity, the number of stresses, the types of response variables. You'll see there are many, many risk assessment methods that are in use in New Zealand, but I'm focusing in, on a few approaches here um, that we found were particularly useful for a risk and uncertainty perspective in terms of EBM. These include simple likelihood consequence approaches, um, through to things like system mapping and then more complex uh, Bayesian network models. So you'll see here in terms of selecting a tool, um, some of these risk assessment methods can include multiple knowledge types. Um, so they can include uh, multiple um, information, including biophysical or ecological data, local knowledge, mataranga Māori or expert opinion. And these are going to be a lot more useful in certain situations. So make sure that you can use all available relevant information um, in data poor situations, selecting a tool that will allow, allow you to use multiple knowledge types is going to be important. So again, don't let that method constrain the process. Use all the relevant information you have. Uh, outcomes, again, can range from low to high. This includes the number and type of components that are being reported on. Um, for example, cultural, ecological, social or economic out outcomes and so on. We also recommend that um, a hierarchy of approaches can be particularly useful depending on the complexity and the risk level. So in terms of um, a hierarchy, we found that these likelihood consequence methods, which are, are fairly simple to um, apply, can be particularly useful if you have a low complexity or a low risk situation. And they can be particularly useful in terms of a scoping phase. So if you're in the early scoping phase, you can use a likelihood consequence matrix to determine the risk and therefore whether a fuller assessment may be needed. Something like um, a Bayesian network um, will produce a, a range of probabilities, and these um, have a number of advantages. Advantages include that they're highly flexible, they can include multiple knowledge types, they can produce estimates of uncertainty, and uh, also can produce multiple outputs, not just ecological. And they're also able to produce spatial and temporal predictions. So when I mentioned the 12 criteria earlier that we uh, evaluated were important for risk assessment methods in an EBM context, BNs, Bayesian networks, are one method that um, could readily address all of those criteria.
Importantly, uh, in terms of gaining consensus, we found through our challenge research that systems mapping and conceptual maps are particularly useful for gaining consensus. Um, and they also enable different knowledge types to be considered. And when you have a range of um, personnel that are involved, use of participatory modeling approaches can remove the black box, but also importantly, ensure that diverse components, what's important locally and diverse outcomes, what are the aspirations for that particular area are considered. So we're going to move on now to step three, which is to explicitly consider uncertainty. Um, so the level of uncertainty will influence the type of assessment method that's needed. Um, also, state whether or not stakeholder participation is needed, the greater the uncertainty, um, the greater the level of uncertainty, the more important it is for stakeholders to participate in analyzing that risk, and also the intervention required. So risk assessments and management decisions, we argue, should not be held up by lack of perfect data. Um, many of the methods that we've recommended can use many different knowledge types and explicitly consider uncertainty if required and still enable uh, decisions to be made even in the lack, even in the face of lack of perfect data. And um, we also suggest that um, uncertainty has two sides and that both sides be presented similar to what they do in health. So for example, if there is an 80% chance that an action will prevent any further degradation, that should be balanced with there is a 20% chance that the action will result in further degradation. Um, as stated, very similar to what they do in health. And just to note, we're often more uncertain about medium risk areas than low and high. So this um, builds on the research that was conducted, thinking about those ecological footprints that Conrad presented on. If we're in an area of good ecological health in green here, because we have a small spatial and depth of our response footprint, um, we can have often more high levels of, of certainty. And once we flip to an alternate uh, undesirable or degraded state, we often have reasonable levels of confidence that that system is degraded. It's as we're approaching tipping points where we might sh have a regime shift and move from a healthy to an unhealthy system that our uncertainty actually increases. So we need to be mindful of linking that uncertainty with management interventions. Um, if we're in a green or a low risk situation, monitoring for further change is likely to be acceptable. Uh, as we're moving towards our uh, medium levels of uncertainty and risk, we may need to be considering uh, risk and let reduce uh, to let reduce um, and recover. But as we are in an alternative, undesirable state, we're likely going to need some form of active intervention or restoration. So linking uncertainty with management interventions is um, an important step. And this leads us nicely into the final step, step four, which is to link uh, risk and uncertainty with management decisions. And this builds on in the example that's been presented by Rich in the cumulative effects uh, presentation where Rich has nicely stepped through some of the considerations in terms of thinking about our guidance related to various types of activities that may be considered. So this example here was for a large scale finfish example, but as noted, we also provide examples for other types and scales of activities. If we're thinking about the risk um, and uncertainty for this particular finfish example, we need to be considering the impact of the proposed activity on that ecological connectivity um, with, when thinking about the response footprint, the ecosystem response footprint. As was also highlighted, we need to be considering uncertainty about the larval connectivity, the risk of generating greater ecological declines than we would expect outside of the direct activity footprint. And this, as noted, can be triggered due to chronic stresses such as sedimentation. So if we have a large scale project um, such as this one and we have a high ecological status, but we've got a, num a number and a range of stresses that can be accumulating, 
our formal risk assessment, we may want to consider uh, something like a BN, which would allow iwi and stakeholder participation in building of that model, gaining consensus, a range of ecological, cultural and social and economic outcomes and drivers can be considered. We can also look at location specific complexity and a range of knowledge types. So these methods can produce risk measures and their associated uncertainties um, that are central to management decision. Um, further, in terms of thinking about linking the ecological status, we also need to be considering that management intervention um, and being explicit around whether or not some of our options may be related to whether or not consents are granted or in different areas, as Rich highlighted, whether or not we may be able to enable an activity while monitoring for further change, or um, we need some active inter intervention and restoration. So linking decisions back to those management actions. And just to note, uh, within the Sustainable Seas um, website, there are additional roadmaps. Um, so there are other summaries that explore risk and uncertainty, and we just wanted to draw your attention to some of these, including um, some of the roadmaps that highlight how to consider the scales at which management is proposed relative to the scales um, of the, system, the ecology in the system. So, um, Naimihi Nui, thank you for your attention. Kia ora, Joe. Thank you for your kareiro. Uh, we've now got some more time for questions, so please put those into the Q&A box. Uh, we've got a couple that have come through, so we'll get started. Uh, so this one came through when talking about cumulative effects, but it might be relevant to both topics. Uh, is there a weighting scale of sort when threatened species may be affected? Um, I'm going to be brutally honest on this. Um, we, you could factor that into the cumulative effects assessments, but it's something that we've reached to the end of this challenge and we are not, haven't got to a point where we've actually been able to apply these in real time and in real situations. But again, it would be part of the consideration process that if you've got rare species within the area, then maybe you'll be take a much more precautionary approach to some of those decisions. Um, but it's not something that we've incorporated explicitly into this. So we're faced with two challenges um, with these uh, frameworks. One was, do we go into a dive into a, a detailed case study and spend our time on, on that? Um, but then people would look at it and go, well, that's not really relevant to what I'm doing. Or do we provide, try and provide these general frameworks and general tools that then need to be worked through. And as they're picked up, and hopefully as they're worked through, there'll be more examples of what they look like applied to these different situations. So we've landed where we've landed in the hope that um, by providing more generality, it will give people options to, to apply and use them. I'm not sure if any other panelists have any other comments on that. I need to say that the um... The principles themselves can still be useful for that purpose too. So, um, you know, there's no reason why, uh, if you're narrowing it down to say a threatened species, you couldn't apply the stress, the stressor principles to assess, you know, the vulnerability to that to that um, species as well. Right. Thank you. Uh, right, I've got a question directed towards Conrad and Richard. Uh, you mentioned the term resilience. How do you know whether lack of response is due to no impact or to resistance? How can the erosion of resistance or resilience be considered in this framework? Um, that's a great question. And if we knew the answer to that, we would have the solution to cumulative effects, I think. Um, we've done some work within the challenge in phase one, um, looking at that erosion of resilience. And I guess the things that come out of that is effectively unless you go out and do a whole lot of work, experimental and empirical work, you don't know where you are on that spectrum because systems are absorbing stress, they're changing, but not we're not necessarily monitoring the right things to know whether the resilience being eroded or the resistance is to that. This is where the, the principles kind of come into it, I guess, is that the more chronic levels and accumulated levels of stress, the more likely we are into a situation where the erosion of resilience is occurring and it's just not resistance. So 
again, if we're, we're working on a precautionary approach, if we're thinking about the ecological status, if it's in good ecological status, it's generally going to have some resistance or resilience. As that ecological status begins to erode, we're losing the big structural components. We've got stresses that are impacting at multiple points on uh, the, the e ecological interaction network. Then we're moving into that danger zone. And as Joe pointed out, it's, the, it's those middle grounds that we're most at risk of flipping into an alternate state or, or crossing a threshold. So I think based on place, based on the best knowledge we have, we can probably put you somewhere along a spectrum of, of resistance versus erosion of resilience. But having a number on that's going to be really, really hard. And I would argue it's probably having a number of it's going to be almost impossible to get. So we're going to have to use the knowledge we have. But generally, as those stressor profiles begin to change, as they even if the ecosystem's not changing, then the more likely we are going to be getting closer to those threshold responses. And I know I've waved my arms around a whole lot on that, but um, if we had an answer to that, we'd be a lot further along in cumulative effects assessments than we already are. I'm not sure if any of the other panellists uh, want to jump in on that. I was just going to add as well that if, if we, again, if we're thinking about it, um, for a context like the aquaculture example, we've identified specific species um, like Katrina or um, scallops, and we have some understanding of their key relationships against, say, a mud gradient, for instance, and we can see that they're on the fritz of their ability to survive in that location, then we could infer that their resilience to additional stress is probably much lower than if they were not being stressed by that mud gradient. So there's a lot of information out there that can inform um, the, the status of that ecological community. And I think taking that more holistic um, approach that's been um, suggested here can capture some of that. Great, thank you both. Uh, we've got a question. Uh, for a development proposal that could impact a threatened species, could a population viability analysis be incorporated into cumulative effects models? Um, for example, with Professor Liz Sluton's work on Maui dolphins. Um, answer is kind of yes. Um, so the, um, the cumulative effects models can be used at a variety of scales, kind of community, a species, a species abundance, and also kind of the variation in the population dynamics. So a simple answer is yes. But the really big thing is to make sure that um, it's probably more the other way around that you're incorporating cumulative effects, that, that you're accumulating the, um, the, if the, the effect that cumulative stresses might have on the population viability rather than actually trying to draw the, the PVA actually into internally into the cumulative effects models because then you'd end up with a very large um, very complicated and possibly less easily interpretable analysis. And we've several, well, um, I've just come back from a, a, a conference in Japan where a lot of the cumulative effects assessment um, frameworks that, that I saw there and risk assessment frameworks were done with very complicated large scale ecosystem models where they're focused predominantly on fish populations, but could also be applied to, um, you know, charismatic megafauna, the, the dolphins and things like that. And again, the, the issues with that is that those models then, if you're using those kinds of models, they get very big and very complicated very quickly and very data intensive. And one of the things we've been really conscious of in developing these frameworks is we need to act now and we need to act on the information that we already have. And I think one of the things that's come out of it is we do know a lot more than we think we know and we just need to capture that different knowledge. So Judy said that yes, it can be incorporated and it can be, but we're better off looking at the cumulative effects, effects on the population. Um, I worry about folk focusing just on populations because we've done that quite a bit um, in, in fishery science and um, that has not necessarily led to the best outcomes in some situations. So thinking about 
um, these populations as part of an ecosystem, um, I think, and networks is really, really important. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and just to add to that conversation, um, from a risk perspective, some of these tools like the BNs can enable you to have parent nodes and child nodes where you can be putting in um, information that's of particular interest and, and consider that from a risk perspective and then run scenarios. So as Judy said, that's another option that's available as well, depending on you know the process and what people want to include in the BNs and the scenarios. Great, thank you all. Uh, we've got another question that's come through. Uh, is the precautionary principle key in informing decision-making with uncertainties, connectivity, and threatened species? Um, so in terms of thinking about uncertainty um, and risk, if you have uh, high uncertainty and high risk, then managing for resilience is going to be important and key. Um, so I, I would say yes, but I'm, I'll open it up to the other panel members. I guess um, the, the precautionary principle, I mean, really should be applied whenever uncertainty and risk is above an acceptable levels. The, the, the key there is kind of what is an unacceptable level. Um, and that can really only, I mean, that at the moment is either done in terms of um, a, a statement in the act about what it is, um, or it needs to be done in a participatory process decision making. Um, when it comes down to it, the, the Unfortunately, we, we don't have a, a really good hold on, um, on how that uncertainty and that kind of risk really kind of combines. I will also add one thing to that, though, kind of there is a tendency to think that if we continue to collect enough information, we can actually develop enough certainty that we will be able to tell whether or not a an action is, is too risky or not. Um, I suspect that that's not, not actually always true and that sometimes it doesn't make any difference how much extra information you get, you're still going to come down to this this dichotomy, which is, you know, when is there too much risk? And some actions might be too risky regardless of the amount of uncertainty. But I think participatory processes is the way to go. Yeah, 